Hey guys, this is a summary of our week five lecture on how calorie restriction can affect insulin resistance and possibly correct diabetes. Um, for this week, we shifted our focus away from the muscle level specifically to a wider focus, a whole body focus. We used to think in terms of uh, DAG and ceramide accumulation and how that's a product of fat uptake and also fat oxidation. Now as we pull back, we're thinking in terms of insulin resistance. Um, so obesity leads to insulin resistance, leads to type 2 diabetes, and those are dictated by total energy intake and expenditure. So on the left, you can see if intake outweighs expenditure, um, you will likely develop obesity and there's an increased risk of insulin resistance. Now this is a fairly gross simplification and certainly, <coughs> excuse me, and certainly um, things can modify the response on each side. For instance, we know that saturated fats are uh, inherently bad and may tip the balance in favor of insulin resistance. While the omega-3s consumed through fish oil, we've seen can prevent the development of insulin resistance and tend to tip the balance in the other direction. Now, this still doesn't answer the underlying question of why DAGs and ceramides accumulate. Why aren't they stored as triglycerides? That's our safe depot. Um, why is it a problem? And why does insulin resistance develop at all? So I went through in um, a fair amount of detail the mechanism at the mitochondria for the development of um, insulin resistance due to an increase in DAG and ceramide content. I'm not going to show you those slides here, but I've included a movie on the website that um, goes through the animations that, that we talked about in class. Um, but a quick summary is that an increase in food consumption without an increase in physical activity essentially saturates the electron transport chain with electrons and reduces flow. So there's no ATP demand, electrons aren't transported, and you get this really reactive situation inside the cell um, where you produce a lot of reactive oxygen species and the redox state changes. Overall, these two things damage proteins, specifically in the electron transport chain for right now. Um, what happens then is that these proteins don't work as well. And this could be why we see a decrease in fat oxidation in obese people. Um, if we can extend these findings to the cell, which is very likely because the redox state and free radicals aren't contained within the mitochondria, then it may be that proteins throughout the cell are damaged as well. And so insulin signaling proteins, uh, fat metabolizing enzymes, those are all proteins as well. Those might be damaged in response to this imbalance of increased energy intake and decreased energy expenditure. Of note, this is hard to reverse. You have to completely rebuild the proteins um, because repair isn't as successful as we'd like it to be. And so that's why type 2 diabetics that have been diabetic for a long time may be less responsive to um, a certain intervention. And maybe why some of the studies that are more short-term in nature, developing diabetes and then recovering diabetes, might not be applicable to um, the general population that have had this problem for a while. And so how do we correct it? How do we correct that imbalance? Well, we can attack both sides of that equation. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is to clear out the electrons from the electron transport chain, which means create an ATP demand. So the best way that we know to create an ATP demand is to exercise. And indeed, you can see that in this study, eight weeks of exercise in obese men improved insulin sensitivity. That's a whole body measure of glucose disposal using the OGTT. So on the left, you can see glucose, and on the right, insulin. The response to both of those is lower, which means that the sensitivity is improved in these subjects um, after eight weeks of training. So this is a three-hour OGTT, and blood glucose and insulin were lower at essentially all time points except at rest. Now why is that? It seems that improved mitochondrial function plays a key role in this response. Um, so CPT1 activity was increased after eight weeks, and whole 
uh, a whole measure of mitochondrial fat oxidation was also increased. So if we take the um, information about the dysfunction at the mitochondria uh, into consideration, we can think of CPT1 as a protein that transports fat into the mitochondria. Fat oxidation depends on protein activity. Um, beta oxidation is full of proteins. All the enzymes in the TCA cycle are proteins. The electron transport chain is all proteins. All of these things need to be working properly in order to support fat oxidation. And so these improvements could reflect improvements in the free radical production and redox state by clearing out the electron transport chain. It's not possible to know from this data because that wasn't the focus of the study, but it's possible. It fits with our hypothesis. So what other strategies do we have? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on exercise because we, we do that a lot. Um, on the expenditure side, exercise we know is good. Um, we may be able to change the effect of exercise by um, using continuous versus intermittent, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but I won't spend a lot of time on that now. On the intake side, we have a few options. We talked about pharmaceuticals briefly, but that's not the focus of the course. Um, what I want to look at now is surgery and then the possibility that calorie restriction can bring about all these positive changes on its own. The calorie restriction idea actually sprang from uh, the success that surgery uh, seemed to provide to these type 2 diabetics. So overall, surgery is quite effective. Uh, it's been known for some time that gastric bypass surgery resulted in significant weight loss after only six months post-surgery, and then these reductions in weight were maintained for six years after surgery. So at a whole body level, great success with bypass surgery. And this is related to an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So the morbidly obese subjects in the third bar were the ones that required surgery. You can see that insulin resistance is quite low, um, lower than the leans, much lower than the leans. And after surgery, this was greatly improved. They're not quite as insulin sensitive as the lean subjects, subject groups, but much more insulin sensitive. And in fact, they're more insulin sensitive than subjects with a similar post-surgical weight. So they've improved a lot, and they're even better than weight-matched controls. Now these results at first were attributed to an improvement in insulin signaling. Um, it's not known exactly why insulin signaling would be better, but some measurements were done, and it seemed as though the proteins were uh, better able to be phosphorylated in response to insulin. Still don't know the mechanism, and it's not really uh, consistent. Also, um, this has been attributed to a change in hunger hormones. So ghrelin and PYY are hormones that control how hungry you are uh, in response to prolonged fasting or in response to a meal. Um, you should turn off after a meal and then turn on after a long time of not eating. And again, these aren't consistent and can't explain the improvements in insulin sensitivity that we regularly see with bypass surgery. It's possible that simply the decrease in energy input is responsible for these changes. After bypass surgery, patients can't eat as much, and so calorie intake goes down, and that might be responsible for um, helping tip the balance in favor of improved insulin sensitivity. So if we look at it this way, um, calorie restriction alone could be responsible for improving this whole body situation. Um, like we talked about in class, the electron transport chain never actually stops. Um, we have a basal metabolic rate that uses ATP, and so there's a little bit of flow trickling through, as well as some leak through the membrane. So we have some expenditure all the time, um, but in a situation where insulin resistance develops, food intake simply outweighs the basal metabolic rate. And so what might happen with bypass surgery is that food intake simply decreases, the balance would then tip in the opposite direction and improve insulin sensitivity. So does that actually work? As it turns out, 
just putting subjects on a very low calorie diet can reverse type 2 diabetes. This diet was 600 calories a day, so very low calorie. Um, and you can see that after only one week, blood glucose returned to normal. Also, the hepatic glucose production returned to normal in just one week. And this seemed to be related to a decrease in the fat that was stored inside the liver. So improved liver function after only one week that continued, it seemed to continue to increase um, throughout the eight weeks of the study. So the liver works better. But not only that, the pancreas works better as well. Pancreas is responsible for releasing insulin in response to a meal. Normally, this response is impaired, and so insulin release isn't as high as you would like it. You can see that here, the deficiency in the beta cells to release insulin in response to just an insulin test. It's really low at baseline, and we see improvements after only one week of this very low-energy diet. Not only that, but this, uh, the beta cells continue to improve and increase insulin release over the eight weeks. And interestingly enough, this seems to be related to a decrease in the fat content of the pancreas as well. Which is a really interesting finding because this suggests that there's a similar disruption going on in other tissues as well, just like the one that we described in muscle. So our problem in muscle was that we had too much fat kicking around. Um, we had these reactive intermediates that interrupted insulin signaling, which is one of the main functions of muscle. Here we see that an increased fat content in the liver and also in the pancreas disrupts their main functions as well. In the liver, it disrupts insulin sensitivity and the suppression of glucose production in response to a meal. Whereas in the pancreas, it suppresses the release of insulin in response to a meal. So overall, um, we're getting the picture of this global problem within the body where all of these tissues are affected by this um, tip in the energy balance towards overconsumption and decreased uh, expenditure. And so with that in mind, knowing that calorie restriction works, we want to move to what strategies there are to um, reduce calorie intake in overweight and obese people and see whether or not they're effective and if this can be used to treat diabetes in the general population.